here we are. Hello, hello. Hello from Seek 2019. Yeah, we are. We're at Seek 2019. I'm Bridget Eyre. Um, another episode of All About the Grace. We are completely winging this because I just ran into Brother. What's your Rigo name? Rigo Asanui. Say it again. I'm Brother Rigo Asanui, and I'm a Capuchin Franciscan. And who are you? I'm Brother Brandon Berg, Capuchin Franciscan. Capuchin. Yes. Capuchin. A uh, cappuccino. Is that yeah, part of so, the well, or what? Definitely, the, that, that brand that, got that, its name from us. So because we're Capuchin, so okay. uh, whoever started the company, he got a name from us. So like, we need like, you know, we need to create some money. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so are you Franciscan? Are you a Franciscan? Tell yes. Me, explain that. Yes, we are Franciscans. I know a lot because of the numerous Franciscan communities out there in the world. You know, a lot of people are not sure who is who. I mean, sometimes I myself I get confused. I don't even know. <laughs> I, I meet some Franciscan, they tell me they're Franciscan, I'm like, okay, I am Franciscan, I don't know you, who are you? So, yes, there are so many Franciscans out there, but the thing is that there are three groups. So there's the first order, the second order, and the third order. Okay, so which ones are you? So, I am a member of the first order, and now okay. it gets more complicated. Okay. In the first order, there are three orders. Okay. So we have the Capuchins, which is what we are, so Capuchin Franciscans. We have the Conventuals, and we have the OFMs. And okay. we all are Franciscans and, in the first order. Okay, so OFM is what I'm most used to. Okay. I went to Bishop Lewis High School in Fort Wayne, which is a Franciscan school, and, and they're all, I think they're all OFMs. Okay. I think. I don't know. Yeah, so, so we all have the initials OFM. Like, if you can look at the Brandon's initials right there, it says OFM CAP. Okay. So there's OFM CAP, OFM Conventual, and then OFM. Okay, so you are based in Washington, D.C.? I am based in Washington, D.C. And what about you? I'm based in Denver, Colorado. But you're in the same order? Same order. We're kind of like, uh, the order's kind of divided up like a diocese. Okay. So we're what we call our diocese provinces. Okay. So there's six provinces of the Capuchin Franciscans in the United States of America. Okay, now what is your what is a charism? Okay, what is a charism? And what are what are your what is your charism as the Capuchin? How do you say that? As a Capuchin as a Franciscan. Franciscan. Capuchin, man, I need a lot of help here. Yeah. Okay, I have to go to confession, but, but you guys are priests, you're fathers, right? We don't need to go to confession. And the confession's coming up at okay. 7 p.m., so. Oh, yeah. At 7 p.m., I'm going to confession. I just got blessed here because I said the wrong thing. No, I'm Okay, so what was my question? What's a charism? What's a charism? What's a charism? What's, what's, a charism? what's a charism and what is your charism? All right. All right, take that one. So basically, the charism is what we do as as, as Capuchin, like our way of life and different missionary works that we do. You know, like certain orders have specific specific uh, activities, for instance, that we do, like the way to serve the people of God. Like when you hear Dominicans, for instance, their specific charism is preaching, which is why they call them a of preachers. So now when it comes to Capuchins, that charism is really diverse, and that's all based on our spirituality, which is founded on the Gospels, because our spirituality is living the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ after the example of St. Francis of Assisi, who is our founder. Okay. So, because we have a diverse charism, we're called to serve in different realms of life. Specifically, where no one is willing to go to serve, we're often open to do that. And then we're called to serve the poorest of the poor. Okay, so that's kind of like Mother Teresa, isn't it? Like how she, her order, tried to serve the poorest of the poor. Exactly. Now, how old is your order? You guys know? Yep. So, uh, I know you guys who never going to get a test, right? Our, uh, our founder, uh, St. Francis, who started the whole Franciscan movement, he died in 1226. So, fast forward about 300 years to 1536, and that's the beginning of the Capuchin Franciscans. So, we're actually a reform movement of the Capuchins that existed at that time. You guys look awfully young to be that. I, you I guys weren't well, original. Yes. You weren't original members. No, I wasn't right? around. Yeah. Okay. We're not original members. Oh my gosh, I would be how many years old? <laughs> okay, so now what's the deal with the beard? You know, why the long beard? Well, my understanding of, of the long beard is that uh, well, originally the beard came from uh, Francis himself. Okay. He wanted everything that he did to imitate Christ, and we intuit and we almost know from Scripture that Christ had a beard. I mean, all Jews at that time had beards, so Francis wanted to do everything that he could to be like Christ, so he grew out the beard. 
Okay, so and then you... the long beard came from the, the tradition of the hermits. So at the time of the 1500s in Italy, there were several, there were lots of lots of reform going on. It was about, you know, uh, Luther was at that time, around 1519, 1520. There was all kinds of reform going on. So there was a strong movement for the hermit life, which is where we got the big hood. Like, at that time in Italy, if you wore a big hood and a long beard, and people saw you, they're like, you're a hermit. And it was, it was clear right away. It was like a sign. Well, was that a good thing? Well, when the captions were first running around, we had to hide out for a little bit with the hermits. Because yeah. we left, because we split away from the Franciscans, and they were upset. Okay. They're like, you know, we have to come back. So, uh, we adopted the long beard and the long pointy hood. It's called a capuche. It's a long pointy hood. We adopted that from the hermits at that time. That is super cool. Now, do you guys ever have competitions to see who can get the longest beard? I mean, yeah. you no, know, you guys are guys, you know, kind of like a, no, you don't do that. Not really. I mean, guys grow it out the way there's a lot of freedom today in the campus uh -huh. And guys are basically free to grow the beard or shave as they feel called by God. Okay. I mean, if you look at Slavis Casey behind it, that's a really neat long beard. Yeah. Um, Patrick Pure himself, which a lot of people know, you know, he had a decent beard himself. I, I'm sure I'm working on mine. It's a slow work, but it's in progress. You know? One, yeah, like a slow progress, but one, one day at a time. Okay, now I don't know how to say your name. Brother, I'm just going to call you Brother so, R. Yeah, so, uh, so it's actually Rico Bell. It's a French name, but I, I prefer to go by Rico, which is a nickname. It's, it's easier. Rico? Right? Yeah, Rico. Okay, Brother Rico. Okay, so you are actually from. Africa? Yes, originally from Africa, Cameroon, to be more specific. Okay, and your native, native language there is English and French? English and French, it is a bilingual country, that is correct. But you did not grow up Catholic. I did not. But at age six, you felt a calling to the brotherhood or the priesthood or what? To be a priest. To be a priest? Yes. So tell me the story about that. Didn't you tell your dad? How'd that go now? Alright, so, so yeah, you're this, six years old. This is like going down memory lane. <laughs> okay, you're six years old, you're not even Catholic, and yep. you tell your dad you want to be a priest? Yes. Okay, so what happened? Okay, so I'm gonna be honest to say Who Okay, this to is be honest, Yeah, you know? this is twenty years ago. So I cannot remember exactly what okay. was going on in my mind when I was six years old. Okay. But somehow yeah, yeah, but somehow I understood what it meant to be a priest. So okay. I remember I was outside in the lawn playing with my older brother Carl. He is two years older than me. So our dad came and he called my brother and he said, What do you want to be when you grow up? So Carl said, I want to be a priest. I was six years old. I heard my brother who was eight years old say he wanted to be a priest. And I, when my dad asked me, I said, I want to be a priest too. Now, I said that because I heard my brother say it. And I said, Well, if he said it, it must be something cool. Yeah. And you know what? I might as well become that. But then from that moment, it was like this inner voice within me that kept on telling me every single day of my life to this day that you said you wanted to be a priest, you have to be a priest. So like that voice stayed. And two years later, and I remember this, like, I remember the exact moment. My dad called my brother and I, again, this was two years later, into the master's bed. He asked my brother, what do you want to be when you grow up? This time around, and I remember he probably doesn't, but he said he wanted to be a pilot. He's not a pilot, so unfortunately. It's not too late, he might still be a pilot someday. And when he asked me, now, I remember saying I wanted to be a priest. But what is interesting is that I said I wanted to be a priest before even thinking about it. So before I thought about the question my dad asked me, I had already said I wanted to be a priest. And from that moment, it's like the voice just became louder and louder. And two weeks later, I went to my dad and I said, Dad, you know what? I said I want to be a priest, and because we're Presbyterians, I want to become Catholic because that's the only way I can be a priest. And my dad was shocked. I mean, he looked like he literally saw a ghost. He said, when you said you wanted to be a priest, I figured you wanted to be a Presbyterian pastor because that's what we do. Every Sunday, that's where we go to church. We don't go to the Catholic church. We go to a Presbyterian church for service. So he figured out that somehow I knew exactly what I meant when I said I wanted to be a priest at six. And I'm, I'm so lucky he, you know, some parents might think that an eight-year-old is too young to make such a decision. But I'm happy that my dad encouraged me. He said, well, it's not like you're saying you no longer believe in God. You still believe in God. It's not like Catholics don't worship God. You worship the same God we worship. So if you want to be a Catholic, by all means. So he let me go, and I 
sitting at Tenney Doctrine classes. I did that for two years, and I was received into a Catholic church of age right now. And so then, that is such a great story. And the, and the fact that you're that your you know your parents support you, that your dad supports you in that. And that. So now, where are you on your journey? Because you are are you on the road to be a priest? Then? Yes, I am considering priest. Okay. But my priority is that I am a brother to my brothers. So I'm looking so forward to taking final vows, which by the grace of God will be this year in August, specifically August 17th. So please give me your prayers. And if that yeah. happens, I look forward to seeing everyone watching or listening <laughs> to, show to, get to show up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it might be at St. Augustine's Parish, if anyone knows that parish. And uh, I think it's, oh, I should know this. I think it's 20th Street. 20th Street? Yeah. Yeah. We'll look it up. Yeah, we'll maybe. Uh, oh, I, mean, I feel so horrible. horrible that I can't remember this at the top of my head. But is it going to be in Pittsburgh at St. Augustine's Church? Hopefully. Um, but I, I'll probably keep you updated. So what about people that are listening that maybe don't believe in God or, you know, you know, don't, not, they're not Catholic or they don't really, what would you say to them? Like, what has God been in your life? Like, is there really a God? It's a deep, it's a deep That's question. A I'm question. just, I'm just yeah, throwing these sure. out to you, you know? So, uh, I mean, what comes to my mind is <laughs> my life experience and my Longing, yearning, searching for God has shown me that God listens to every prayer that everyone speaks. You know, and He answers every prayer, yes, no, or wait. So if you don't know God or don't believe in God, just ask for it and pray for it. And I mean, the answer is probably going to be wait, but God is going to answer that prayer. And, uh, you know, in my own, like, sort of deepest, darkest times when I've called out for God's help, and, you know, I, I've never seen a flash of light or, or a, a, you know, magical experience, but, you know, when, it, it, and when, when I most often see God's presence is when I look back, you know, to see where I was and where I've come to and how I've, uh, you know, how things have gotten not always better, but have changed through that period. Okay, so, you know, what I asked Brother Rigo. Rigo, yes. <laughs> His story. Yes. What about your story? How did you, how did you get into all this? Yeah. I mean, you, you're not, you weren't born with one of these on. I was you? not. Yeah, I was born naked like everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> can um, we say that? Yeah. Say yeah. That? <laughs> Who wasn't born naked? How can you? Right, 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 right. Okay. Right, yeah. So, then, um, so what happened? Yeah. Thanks for asking. It's. Uh, I was raised Catholic, cradle Catholic. Uh, my parents divorced when I was three. My mom got full custody of me. I'm my only child. So uh, the phrase that I've come to understand is like, I was sacramentalized, but not catechized. Yeah. So my mom was one of the religious education teachers. So I went through all of it because I had to, because mom paid for the roof over my head and the food in my belly. But you're, I never, you're going I, to I, I, that's you're right, going to church. right. You're and I didn't fight it because it was, you know, there was, I didn't have a brother or sister to pawn it off on. <laughs> so, you know, my experience of Catholicism was I was in a small country parish with a huge crucifix of Jesus over the altar. It's beautiful and I love it, but you know, Christ is dead. So I'm like, well, Jesus is dead. And like, oh, he, only, okay. he only comes out of that box like one hour on Sunday and then you know, that's basically it. You're referring to the tabernacle, The right? tabernacle, yeah. For the non-Catholics non that don't yeah. know what that Where is. Where we keep the Eucharist on reserve for, for Holy Communion. So, uh, I went to college, you know, being sacramentalized but not catechized and not having a relationship with God or with Christ. So, as soon as I could leave a practice of the faith, which was minimal, I, I left it totally. And I was doing everything that the world said would bring me happiness. Uh, but that left me empty inside eventually. So about my junior year of college, I was, you know, partying as hard as I could, but I was empty inside, and I knew I needed God. And so I started looking for God, and I was sure that God was going to be anywhere but the Catholic Church, right? <laughs> I've so heard that I, I looked before. here, I looked there, I looked up, I looked down, um, and just I was at a Catholic college, thanks be to God, and I had some good Catholic friends that, that brought me, you know, into some of the practice of the faith. And uh, I was able to study the church's teaching on my uh, church's teachings on my own and learn that they're actually for my happiness. They're not just a killjoy. God doesn't want me to not have fun. God wants me to have fun, like real fun that'll give me life instead of leave me empty inside. So then, uh, but I was still kind of living a double life sometimes. And I graduated from college and had a better relationship with God. 
But then uh, I went to work in restaurants, and I was living with my college roommates, and I finally faced a decision in my life. Do I want to live in the big city, Kansas City, Kansas, and work in a restaurant, live with my college friends? Do I want to move out to a town of 630 people and open a restaurant with my dad? So these were my two choices. And uh, I had learned a prayer called the Memorare. Yeah. It's a special prayer to Mary where it says, Never was it known that anyone would pray to your intercession. And I was like, Man, that's me. I could get some of that, right? Yeah. Never. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm in the never book now. <laughs> so we had this meeting where we decided we wanted to open our own restaurant, but we didn't have enough money, but we were going to try. And uh, But I still wasn't sure what to do, so I went uh, to my old college campus to pray. I was praying in front of the statue of Mary, and in that moment of prayer, it was really the first time I was like, God, you know, tell me what you want me to do with my life. Here's the two choices. And like in that moment of prayer, I heard and I felt the same words that Brother Rigo expressed, be a priest. Wow. And I, I, and like, I like that was to, option three, right? Well, I like to say if I'd have made a list of a thousand things to do with my life, like priesthood would have been like 997. Like I'm a male and I'm sort of Catholic, so I guess. But like with that experience, it like whoo, went all the way up to like number one. And so, that, so that was 2004. So it took some years. I wasn't ready yet. I applied to an order. I got turned down. I started over again. I had to uh, go through the 12 steps to get rid of some substance abuse in my life. And that gave me the freedom to really discern. And then I visited different orders. I found Capuchins and God said, be a Capuchin. So uh, I started that process in 2009 with postulancy where I joined the Franciscans. I uh, did my divisiate. Uh, it took first vows in 2012. Now I'm doing a pastoral internship as I continue my process towards the priesthood. So you on you're on your road on the road to becoming a priest. Yes. And you are on the road to be you are becoming brother, a priest. You become a priest, priest too, but my priority right now is taking final vows in August, which is the, the, the main thing. Like I'm, I'm first a brother before anything. So we are brothers who are priests. But okay. we're all brothers. So okay. some of the brothers are priests. But it doesn't mean that it's like a hierarchy where if you are ordained, then you are better than he who is not ordained. So we're brothers to each other, brothers without distinction. Okay, so if someone watching was thinking about maybe they have a call to your order, or to be a priest, or to be a brother, what would you, each kid have an opportunity to answer this question, what would you say to them in terms of how would you, what would you say to them if they're thinking, maybe God's calling me to this, or, or maybe let's start, how do I get to know God? Let's start there, for people who maybe don't know God, and then the second thing is, how do I know I'm being called to God? What advice or, or suggestions would you give to God? I know he didn't get questions ahead of no, I'll give you a chance to think, yeah. who wants to go first? You can answer whatever I asked. Well, I would say about getting to know God, you know, like I was saying earlier about my own experience, is just ask God for God to show you who God is. Because God wants to answer that prayer. God longs, God already knows every heart, and God longs for you to know that God knows your heart already. So just, just pray for that. And then, um, or if you don't know how to pray, just say, God, if you're real, if you love me, show me. And then take it from there. And, um, you know, I, I learned how to pray by watching the faces of my friends who knew how to pray. Like we would kneel down and I would look at their faces and I'm like, they, they're doing something that I don't know how to do. Like they knew a God who was alive. So ask people, ask your friends, go, go on YouTube, search how to pray, get a good book from a Catholic bookstore or something like that. Um, and that, that, and through prayer we can come to know God. And then. Um, if you do come to know God and you feel called by God to do something with your life, uh, particularly a vocation to the priesthood or religious life, you need to think about it, but then you have to do something about it. Like some people, action, right? some people say I'm discerning, but they've never talked to a vocation director or visited a community. So just get out there, you know, visit, call your local diocese, go to the local monastery, friary, if you're a nun, call some sisters, and just go there and see them. You know, ask them if you can come in a retreat and find where your heart feels at home and then stay close to God and God will lead you where you need to be. What about you? Well, those were so many questions there, but I would, <laughs> I would try to start somewhere. So, I mean, if you are a millennial like me, it's 
possible that you might have doubted the existence of God at some point, or you're currently doubting the existence of God. I went through that, despite my history of always wanting to be a Christian six. But here is something I will tell you. I sat one day, and I brought this from St. Anselm. I, I majored in philosophy in college, and I started trying to imagine of a being that transcended my, my own understanding. And I realized I couldn't bring myself to know of a being that transcended my experience, my, my understanding. And I was like, well, then that being has to be God. Because if I can comprehend such a being, then that being is within space and time, for instance. But then because there has to be a being that goes beyond my understanding, then that being is God. You know, some people think that, okay, the Big Bang, therefore no God. Come on. There's no way that we can even have a Big Bang without having something causing it's the Big Bang. So it's like, so, so for some, so my, the, my, the cause of my existence are my parents. I'm here because my parents. And if we keep doing the regression, we cannot do a regression to infinity. We have to get to a point where there's a mover or, or a cause that causes without its own existence being caused by another. So because my parents' own existence is my grandparents. But we cannot go, we have to reach a point where there has to be a being whose own existence is not caused by another, and that being is God. So, do we fully comprehend this being? No. I mean, if we do that, that's like saying, I am God, pretty much. If I say I can comprehend this being, then I will be God. And I cannot take that credit. That would be, I don't know. I don't know what that would be, but definitely I, I cannot comprehend that being. So, that's just, if, if that is helpful for you, just to maybe sit and try to imagine, you know, think about this being that transcends your understanding, then you might just come closer to realizing that God does exist and He is responsible for all that is. So what about if you're um, thinking about a call to the priesthood, what advice would you give to them or the religious side? Or, or specifically your order? Okay, so... What, what, what do they do? What if they're afraid? Are they, you know, what advice would you give to somebody who, a guy who might be watching? Because a lot of guys watch YouTube all the time. I mean, that's a huge demographic. And I think it's like over, um, I don't know, it's like... 80% of all Americans are on YouTube, so, you know, they may just find us randomly. So, what would you say? Uh, as the saying goes, if you see something, say something. I'm going to say, if you hear something, which might be the voice of the Lord, and He could use another person to talk to you, it might just be me saying, hey, have you ever thought about being a priest or religious? Or it could be, you no, know, just something happening in front of you. So, if you hear something, do something. So, if someone tells you, have you thought about religious life or priesthood, then you should probably act on that, just as Brother Brandon said. Now, doing something then means that go online, again, for millennials, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like we're born within, like the internet is part of our life. So let's I use did. it. Let, let's use it. And, well, and that's true, yeah. Oh, I forgot about Gen X, Gen Z. Yeah, yeah, I don't know what they call these days, but it's probably one I of the most. I the new yeah. generation. Yeah. They've so, only known iPhones. Yeah, you know? that's but you're right. one of those. You, got, you understand yeah. technology. So, so the internet is there. Let's make good use of it. Get on Google and you know, explore this. Check if, if you're hearing, be a religious or be a priest. Look it up. Read something about it. Now, if you want to look for a particular order, I mean, I'm a capuchin, and I tell you we're awesome. And, I mean, just look at look at that, awesome. That's a neat beard right there. I mean, and if you're not a beard person, you want it more shaven, I mean, you can go with mine. And the others who are really clean shaven. So if you don't like one beard at all, you're not obliged to wear it. So yeah, if you are looking for a particular order like ours, capuchin, Franciscans, we want you to be looking for. And uh, we have six provinces in the U.S. So depending on where you are in the U.S. We have the New York, New England province. We have the Pennsylvania province, which is my province. And for the Pennsylvania province, we cover the states of Pennsylvania, Maryland, Washington, D.C., West Virginia, Ohio. And we have two missions. We have a mission in Puerto Rico and Papua New Guinea. And we have, so that was the second province. We have the Denver province, which is for the Brandon. And I'll let him tell what territories they cover in the yeah. U.S. So we're actually called uh, St. Conrad's Mid-America Province, and uh, mainly we work in Texas, Kansas, and Colorado, and we also uh, share the mission territory of Papua New Guinea with uh, St. Augustine's Province. Okay, and so that was the third province, the Denver Province, or Colorado, or the St. Conrad Province. 
Now the third would be the California province, and so they cover pretty much the west coast. So I'm, not, much I'm not very with all the territories, but so they cover the west coast. Pretty good. <laughs> But pretty much anywhere in the United States, you can. If you want anywhere to be, in the world, we're an well, international order, 190 countries. So, either your country or it's one very close has Capuchin Francis. So, if you go online and you type capuchin.com, it will take you to our website. And this is like some of the guys' information in my province. You see, like we're really diverse. So, we got. I mean, this calendar has guys from at least 15 countries, 15 different countries, yeah, but we're all living in the U.S., so you're all welcome to religious life. So um, I hope that, that this has been inspiring for you. This has been totally impromptu, <laughs> just walking by. It's like the Holy Spirit. Yeah, like the Holy Spirit. Yeah, thank you, Bridget. Yeah, it's well, been a pleasure. Thank you so yeah, much. God bless you. Bridget, you. Yeah, I wish, nice you, you. wish you much success. Yes. And hopefully we'll get some Go work. focus and go seek. Yeah, right. and, thank um, you, everyone. Yeah, God bless. Bye-bye. Peace.